All right. Well, let's go straight to the award section. We are going to be talking about our first half, first half of the season, MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, Goalkeeper of the Year, Coach of the Year, and Newcomer of the Year. So, yes, Andrew? I'm very disappointed uh, that Referee of the Year was not on here. Um, we have we already made our pick for referee of the year. Yeah, and now we can do the halfway point, but it's all right. I I I, I hold no grudges. <laughs> you can't change your pick. You can't. You got to support your guy for the full season. I'll be honest. I don't even remember who I picked, but I could check back on my notes. All right. I, so I know MVP is first on the order, but let's save that one for last. So let's go for defensive player of the year first, and I will let you start it off. We're doing defensive player of the year first. Yep. First half of the season, defensive player of the year. Who you got? Uh, Easy. Dylan Nealis has been absolutely unreal this year. Uh, Um, He has been very good, though, actually. But you need to look at the best defensive teams out there right now. And we've talked about this guy already. Charlotte stands out to me as a team that should be in this conversation. And Adelson Melanda should be in this conversation. Uh, And I'm going to pick him because I think he will continue the trend that Dean Smith has set out for this team. And and you are absolutely right. I was very concerned about him in 2023. I watched him play against Red Bull in the, in the playoffs. I watched him play a couple games, you know, when Red Bull weren't playing, he was not anything like he was this year. He's made a huge step forward, been very, very solid. He's very good in one V one scenarios. He's got really good size, really good speed. He's strong in the air. He's on the ball a good a good lot in this system, and he doesn't lose it very often. He's getting a ton of looks overseas, and it's for a good reason. He, I believe, will see this out. And if if Charlotte makes the playoffs with the rec goal, the goals against record that they have, and do something decent, you know, a deep ish run into said playoffs, I think that it will be a, a no brainer for him. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, he was one of the guys that I was considering for this. Uh, I didn't end up going with him, but he was he was right there in that conversation. I think he's had a really strong year. I, I went the same route as you. I kind of was like, all right, well, got to start by just looking at whoever's been the strongest defensive teams in the league and then kind of working my way from there and seeing who some of the strong performers have been in that uh, on those teams. And defensive player of the year always goes to center backs. So yeah. I kind of went down that route as much as the fullbacks deserve the love as well. But my pick, and maybe this is where where the clip will come in, and you could clip it and send it and do whatever you want. I'll I'll help get the engagement in. But my pick for first half defensive player of the year is Aaron Long for LAFC. Get in. I'm, <laughs> listen, you don't even need to say the episode can end right here. That is the <laughs> correct answer uh, every day of the week and three times on Sunday. Yeah, so I know... Probably anybody outside of L.A. Uh, obviously isn't following Aaron Long week in, week out. Uh, I am, again, one of those people as well. But he has been statistically very good for LAFC. And LAFC, in turn, have been one of the best defensive teams in the league, which is surprising because LAFC's entire mantra since being in the league has been high scoring and defense is secondary. But while they're still scoring a decent amount of goals, they've been really good defensively. They are the best defensive team in the Western Conference right now. And Aaron Long has been a big part of that. His per 90 defensive numbers were very strong across the board in terms of like tackles, blocks, interceptions, and whatnot. Uh, he has His team has had a ton of success when he's been on the field. He's a really strong plus minus. Uh, I'm bringing out a new stat that I found, the XG plus minus. His XG plus minus was off the board compared to all the other center backs that I was looking at. He was far and away the best one. Uh, And he was dominant in the air. Uh, He hasn't had to go for a lot of aerial duels, but when he has, he's won 85% of them, which was far and away the highest. So he has been very good this season for one of the best defensive teams in the league. And so I ended up picking him. It, It was, I looked through a bunch of teams. There was nobody that was like jumping out to me as a clear and obvious defensive player of the year choice. Uh, but for me, Aaron Long was just that little bit better than the other guys, a which plus. I know you support. <laughs> a plus. I don't think I've ever seen you make a pick as good as that one. That is. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure that's... you agree. 
that's the unreal. only the only next logical step is national team get them back in the team <laughs> yeah i mean listen we, we've <laughs> talked about it the last time the u.s played uruguay they posted a clean sheet and who was the center back aaron long numbers don't lie history repeats itself if you choose it to right um, All i'm saying aaron long matt miaska let's reunite and make it happen. well matt, matt miaska unfortunately cannot he broke his face and he's out for the year well when he's back Nothing um, right now. I do want to give an honorable mention to Justin Glad. I think he's been been really good for RSL as well. And listen, the, you know, RSL has a has a, a a really good trend right now of developing good young homegrown players. And I think he's got a ton of promise that he can really, you know, a few more years like this, he can just take his game to the next level because he's been playing for fourteen years, but he's like twenty. <laughs> so <laughs> um, he's like he's like Diego Fagundes. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's he's RSL's Diego Fagundes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but on, on a real, he's been very, very solid. Uh, again, RSL, they've got a great attack, but their defense has been pretty good too. And, and Glad's a good part of that. Yeah. He was one of the guys I could see. I did a, I did a compare on FBRF. They have a cool compare tool to look at a bunch of the stats. And I did, uh, I was comparing Milanda, Justin Glad, Miles Robinson, Ranko Veselinovic, Maya Yoshida, and Aaron Long. So those were the guys that I was looking at. All right. Goalkeeper of the year. Let's start with the goalkeeper himself. Who have you gone with? Oh, that's me. I'm a goalkeeper. That's right. Yeah. Um, listen, nobody, nobody's been better in these last couple of weeks than Ryan Mara. I mean, stepping in after an unbelievable uh, professional couple of years, having to sit behind. All right, I'm done. Um, <laughs> you got your Red Bull moment. Yeah. Listen, um, no, no disagreements uh, with something you mentioned earlier. Uh, Matt Freeze at New York City has been unbelievable. I watched him against uh, against Red Bull when we went and, and watched the derby with, with Pops, and he was unreal. And it took a wonder goal to beat him. Um, and that was not a, a you know step up for the derby and then be bad every other game. I mean, he's done this consistently. And like you said, we, you know, big save, big save. And unsurprisingly, the leader in the greatest stat of all time, PSXG plus minus by almost two full PSXG plus minus points, which is of uh he's been great yeah uh i have also gone for matt freeze i remember when nyc made that move we're, we're at the point now where um we had graded these moves and i remember specifically giving a bad grade for this move because i did not really you did i think i gave him a good move you give everybody a good grade you never give anybody a bad grade yeah. Uh, but I, I definitely gave this uh, like I may have given this an F, which is obviously terrible now, but uh, didn't have high expectations for him coming over as the backup from Philly. And they gave up a lot of money to bring him in. But so far, he's been worth every cent because he was really good last year when he got his moments and he's carried it into this year. And and I am in full agreement that he has been the first half goalkeeper of the year. I honestly think. <laughs> We might be too biased on our favorite stat, though. We just go to our favorite stat. Oh, he's winning by a lot. Okay, he's the best. Well, I mean, <laughs> the stat tells you a good bit of what you need to do because, in in my opinion, the that that tells you who is because again, you can look at the saves or you can look at this clean sheet, but that all has stuff to do with other players around them, right? Are you are you conceding a ton of shots? Are you not seeing any and getting a ton of clean sheets. This is a true measure of success as a goalkeeper in making saves you shouldn't make. Let's move on to coach of the year. I already know where you're going to, you're probably going to go with this. So why don't you just get it out of the way? Get it over with. What? Talking about Sandra Schwarz or, or Red Bull? Oh, yeah, no, I, fully ex- I, I fully expect Sandra, Su- Sandra Schwarz. No, I'm. I mean, Red Bull legend Chris Armas also comes to mind, right? You, you have to you have to keep those those options open. But for me, overall, uh, Pablo Mastroianni from RSL turned a locker room that had a ton of problems into one that believes in their process, trusts it, and knows that it will take them to their end goal. His interview on the the Major League Journeyman podcast was unbelievable, and I know you think I, I promote them too much, but um, are you they, secretly a member of the pod? That's what bro, I need to know. It, it, I would love to be a member of that pod. The stories that they can tell, unbelievable. You would really just leave me like that for another podcast? Dude, th- I would pay them to leave <laughs> you for that quickly. No. Um, listen, he, he he spoke really, really well about 
getting guys to buy into a system, being a part of something bigger? How do you convince players who were in such a toxic environment the year before to turn it around and believe in what you're doing? Uh, and not only has he done that, but he's gotten the results to prove it. So uh, I think he's worked wonders with a side that, you know, if you go and look at net spend and all those things, they're, they're not very high. So uh, he's done really, really well with a group that realistically shouldn't be there, you know, based off of all the, the stats and the metrics. So I was going to say something and then I Googled him and I completely got distracted by this picture of him with an insane mustache, like an outrage, like put honestly, I, <laughs> yeah, I remember challenging that. Tom Bogert. With I remember one. that. Yeah. That, that takes Tom Bogert and Sasha question puts him to shame. I, I agree. Yeah. That's I remember that picture. I think it's super impressive. I, by the way, I also went with Pablo Mastroeni. I knew, I figured you were going to go with him. That's more so where I meant when uh, I knew who you would go with. I mm -hmm. think we were on the same page there. But yeah, I think the ability to to take a locker room that had issues and keep the same coach and resolve those issues, I think is really impressive because I feel like a lot of times when you see locker rooms go toxic, the coach is almost, the, almost always the first one out. Mm -hmm. And then that's like always what's the way that you can resolve the locker room complex. But instead, they stick with Mastroeni. He, I guess, moves on from players that were causing some toxic issues in the locker room. And the result has seen them jump all the way to the top of the West, have been super dominant on both sides of the ball and have genuinely looked like the best team in the entire league. So uh, hats off to him. It's a really good roster build and he's been doing a really good job with that roster build. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Down to the last two. Let's hit newcomer before we hit MVP. Who is your new first half newcomer of the year? Now I don't even need to make it a joke. It's Emil Forsberg. And it's not necessarily for his stats, but for the I, I believe newcomer of the year is the player who comes in and has the biggest impact on his side. And you can tell that when he isn't there, this team is nothing. He doesn't have the most goals or the most assists or, or the most on, you know, ball progressions or advanced stats or whatever. But the difference between Red Bull when he's there and when he's not there are two completely different animals. You've got a team that is fun to watch. They're exciting. They're expansive. They're very technical when he's in the team. And when they're not, it's like the last five decades where it's a bunch of homegrown players, one or two, de you know, decent tan players. And we're hitting the ball as high as we can and trying to trying to win it higher up the field because we don't have the technical ability to play through the lines. Like he and, and here's the thing. I don't think he's played up to the level that he can play up to. Like, I don't think he's he's crossed a line where he's like hit his peak yet for this team. But you can see that when we are missing him, we are terrible. Uh, and that is why I think he's the most influential newcomer of the of the season. I think you're 100 percent biased. Your Red Bull is showing and you're a shell. Wow. I will go with Luis Suarez for okay. if not just strictly the, the statistics. 17 goal contributions in 1100 minutes is crazy return. And I know he's benefiting, obviously, from the Messi effect and everything else going on at Inter Miami and teams having to focus more on Messi and being able to take less pressure on Suarez. But he's been phenomenal. 17 goal contributions, none of them from the penalty spot. The guy has, when he's been healthy, when he's been playing and he's been healthy, he's been extremely dominant, probably even to a level more so than what we were expecting. I know we were some of the few people, I shouldn't say some of the few people, but we were some of the people who I think had pretty like good expectations for him heading into the season. I know a lot of people were talking about his age and the fact that he's getting like injections in his knee, but we had seen what he was able to do in Brazil. And we figured that he was going to be able to keep that form coming in. I still don't think we were expecting him to, you know, blow up the way that he has so far this season. But he's been extremely dominant. Uh, I think the second half of the season is all going to come down to how much he's going to play. I know that was your your bold prediction for the season. It was a question that everybody had, I think, at the start of the season was how much are these guys going to play? How much are they going to play together? I think that's going to continue to be a question for the second half of the year. But in the first half, even though he's a couple hundred minutes behind some of the other guys who have been consistent throughout the entire year. He's still the fifth highest in goal contributions. And it's a testament to how good he's been. I'll tell you, I think my bowl predictions on a, a pretty good path right now. I would say so too. Yeah. But you're benefiting right now from Copa America. So you're cheating a little bit. What do you mean? That was the whole point. Of 
No, it was about health, not other tournaments. Wah. All right. <clears throat> Should we wrap this up with MVP? Let's it should be it. a good discussion. There's a couple guys here that are in the conversation, I believe. So do you want to go first or second? <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll take it first because you got, a, as you mentioned, you got a couple of them, right? You got Messi's 21 goal contributions in a super team. You've got Lucci's 22 goal contributions in FCC. Uh, Chicharrano carrying RSL to the top with 21 of his own. And I think really the the answer lies on on kind of what you value more. So, uh, for me, it is Lewis Morgan. All right, you got your Red Bull in. <laughs> your Red Bull bit in. Good job. Um, no, no, I kid, I kid, I kid. Um, he's been good though. Credit to him. He's no, he's, yeah, he's been. I almost picked him. If you did come back Player of the Year, I would have put him in there, but you didn't. Well, it's not um, a full year, so we'll talk comeback when it's when it's done. I'm gonna go with Chicharrano. Um, you know, Messi and, and uh, Lucio Costa both have these kind of dual roles where they're scoring goals and they're creating. They usually are expected to create lots of chances in the number 10 role or even in Messi's kind of offset nine, float around, do whatever you want type of role. But very rarely do you see a guy who is a number nine, a pure out and out number nine, who is creating chances uh, like Chicharrano is. He's got 16 goals, but five assists as well. I mean, you haven't seen a striker with assists like that since the days of Fabio at Red Bull, you know? Isn't he uh, still there? <laughs> those, those, no, he's, he's long gone. We tried to bring him back on loan a second time and he, uh, he turned us down to go on loan in Brazil instead. <laughs> uh, Brazil's second division, by the way. Um, Listen, Aranjo does it all. He scores, he play makes, he's strong in the air. He is him. And I think he keeps that up this year as well. Now, what do I think is going to be the long-term answer? I think it's going to be messy because, you know, script. But I was getting Fabio confused with Elias Manuel. Oh, yes. Oh, Elias, Manuel is there. Elias Manuel only scores against Charlotte. So if you're not Charlotte, keep scrolling. Hey, that's tough to do. Not a lot of people are scoring against Charlotte this season. So he, he didn't either, to be fair. So. <laughs> For the sake of keeping our podcast and keeping us safe, I will pick Messi so that we don't get hunted down by the Messi fans. Um, I think if, if there was a, a midseason award, I think unquestionably the league would give it to Messi, uh, which is definitely not fair to Lucci and Chicho Araujo, who have both been phenomenal as well for top teams. But Messi, when Messi is healthy, he's unquestionably the best player in the league. And, and we knew this going in. It's not like it's a surprise. It's not like he's uh, overachieving what we expected for him. But he's just so far and above the best player when he's out on the field. The only issue is just the question of, like, how much is he going to be out on the field? Because he's played a fair number of minutes so far. He's played 1,100. Or, sorry, no, he's actually only played 1,000. Which still is, like, it's a decent number, especially compared to the half season last year where he was in the league. But he's still like 500 or 600 minutes behind. I mean, he's 500 minutes behind both Lucci and Chicho Rano. So you can only imagine what Messi is capable of if he was playing as much as Lucci and Chicho Rano have, considering he's already matching them in goal contributions with 500 less minutes. Uh, not to mention his team is also top at the moment, top of the Sporter Shield. I know they played a few more games than everybody else, but he is turned this team around, made them successful. He's been extremely dominant when he's played. Like he, It's to the point where I think everybody in Fantasy Champions League, if Messi is playing, you just throw the captain on him every time because you know he's going to tear it up and do something. So uh, despite the fact that he hasn't played as much, I think his dominance when he does play is, is MVP worthy. That's a couple really interesting there. First off, you're more afraid of Messi stands than you are of the Middlesbrough uh, attack that we're getting on on social media. You're afraid you you you'll say whatever you want about Middlesbrough, but Messi, no, can't cross that line. <laughs> and, and secondly, I, I noticed how you you just slid Fantasy Champions League in there like a, a, a subtle brag, like you're going to make Champions League or something. I didn't I didn't say anything about that. I, yeah, I won't did. say anything about that until it's confirmed. Oh, you're not going to jinx it, man. Nope. It'd be such a shame. It'd just be a shame if you bought it. Would this. be it would honestly. If you, be. If you did, I, I wouldn't play. Anymore. I would genuinely just hang it up. I it would be the choke job of the century. It'd yeah, be you'd be insane. you'd be Spurs, but you'd be the combination of Spurs and uh, Liverpool on the last day. You know, I have a 35 point cushion, and I have the same captain as like 95 percent of people. So <laughs> you, you've gone I, in and made everybody's team. <laughs> No, I just figure I do. I I can't imagine people didn't captain Lucci, but 
if if I blew it with that, that's like astronomically down bad. Yeah, I agree. I I, w- I will one hundred percent agree with you. If I if I don't make it, I will never play chan- fantasy again. Yeah, that's fair.